Flying to and from a VOR is a relatively straightforward thing, but there are certain things we have to take into account uh, when we cross a VOR, especially if we're turning to a different uh, direction on the outbound side. So we're in the CRJ here to demonstrate this uh, because the CRJ flies higher and faster than a lot of aircraft that people might relate to uh, using a VOR for navigation. Uh, first thing to do is to get ourselves set up to fly to the Baltimore VOR. Uh, and you can see we uh, have centered the needle, or nearly centered the needle. Uh, and we can hold the nose of the airplane just a little right of center for now to bring that needle into play. You'll find that when you are a fairly good distance away from a VOR that the um, one degree change of the cursor will move the needle either right or left of center and it won't really be able to be centered. So you might have to fly slightly uh, into that as we're done, we've done here. And once on course, we can nudge our way back a little to the left to keep the needle centered, or the center segment of this needle centered in this case. And we'll continue to climb to our cruising altitude of 25,000 feet. We'll take a look at ourselves on the uh, Plan G map. You can see the Baltimore VOR at the lower right hand portion of the map and there we are uh, just crossing uh, Interstate 295 right now. The first uh, thing we have to remember about any VOR is that there's an area called the Cone of Confusion and this cone extends up uh, and can be several miles wide depending on your altitude. At our altitude, 25,000 feet, we're going to expect this the cone of confusion to be five or six miles uh, wide at least, if not uh, a little wider. And what happens in the cone of confusion is, is that when you're very close uh, to the VOR in the, in the cone, you begin to fly rather erratically if you're using the nav hold uh, to fly you to the VOR. As you get very close to the VOR, the cone of confusion, uh, makes things very sensitive. The plane will tend to hunt back and forth. Here we are back in the cockpit and uh, you can see the uh, nav hold is on. Here it is the LOC sim symbol, L-O-C. Uh, the, uh, there's various nomenclature. The button actually in the CRJ says NAV. Uh, the indicator says L-O-C, LOC. On a, some air aircraft, the button is labeled VOR slash LOC for VOR slash localizer hold, sometimes nav hold. So here we are, just slightly to the left of our inbound course, and the autopilot should bring us a little to the right in order to center the needle again. Show this in the virtual cockpit. And uh, notice that if we nudge the heading slightly, the, the aircraft will follow that. It will turn as long as you have the autopilot with uh, VOR loc uh, engaged or VOR localizer engaged. And uh, it will straighten things out. So here we are. We're getting uh, closer to the VOR. The cone of confusion, again, we expect to be uh, somewhere uh, several miles outside of the Baltimore VOR, approximately where the arrow uh, is pointing right now. And as we enter the cone of confusion, as I said, as long as we have the autopilot on, it will try and track the inbound route to the VOR, although you'll see as we enter the cone of confusion that the autopilot will tend to hunt back and forth, and the obvious solution to this is not to have the autopilot on. But for this uh, initial example, we'll show what happens when we do have it on, and so that you can see how autopilots behave as you pass over a VOR. 
and back in the aircraft uh, you can see that we're uh, uh, just under 10 nautical miles or 10 DME out and uh, we are right now on course with the autopilot engaged and you'll notice that as we drift off course a little bit the aircraft will turn itself to try and re-intercept the inbound course as we get closer and closer into the cone of confusion things will get more and more difficult for the autopilot to do this and you'll see that it begins to swing back and forth trying to keep us on uh, on track the other factor to keep in mind again uh, we are at 25,000 feet which is about four and a half miles give or take above the VOR the closest DME distance we get we're going to get then is four and a half feet and you can see we're struggling again to try and hold the inbound course and we're getting close to that four and a half uh, mile point and now you'll see that two needle uh, the two triangle go away the needle sw swung erratically and now actually the VOR is a uh, signal has been lost the localizer hold the VOR localizer hold uh, shuts off automatically when we re-enter into the outer edges of the cone of confusion the triangle has now turned to from uh, and we can see that the VOR is active again because the, uh, the split needle is present and the triangle is back on now pointing behind us as we fly from the VOR. We're still pretty close to the VOR and we're also um, not on course so we'll turn right a little bit again the autopilot is off it is automatically disengaged we'll turn right a little bit in order to intercept the outbound course in this case we have not made a turn and notice we only uh, turn out just a little bit of an angle about 10 12 degrees because this close to the VR things happen very quickly and as the uh, center portion of the needle be begins to become aligned with the remainder of the needle the fixed portion we can turn back a little to the left and uh, now continue on the same course that we overflew the VOR at. However, uh, doing it this way puts us off course because in reality we wanted to make a left turn and uh, go up at about a 070 degree uh, heading. It's actually the 068 radial. And in order to again exaggerate the point a little bit, We'll now need to make a pretty hefty left turn in order to get ourselves back to the 068 radial and back on course where we want it to be to begin with. So we've uh, changed our uh, VOR heading to zero, uh, in this case it's actually at 075 right now. And we'll go to the 2D cockpit just so you can see that. Uh, and you can see that we're considerably off course. The course we want, even 075, is considerably to the left. And we're a good ways away now, uh, over 20 miles, D over 20 DME out. And so the angle that we can take uh, can be a fairly uh, steep one. Normally you would fly this at uh, 30, 35 degrees uh, difference between your desired course and your intercept course. Here we're going to crank it around a little bit farther than that just to get ourselves turned and move it up there uh, a little more quickly. So we'll we'll hit this at about 50 uh, or so degrees difference between the uh, course of flight and the desired course that we'll eventually seek. I'll adjust this uh, to uh, 070 again. I, as I said the actual course is uh, 068 uh, but the, you'll see here by this the technique for uh, intercepting an outbound radial is basically to turn at a, an angle and fly yourself towards it. And in, the, in this case, in VOR navigation, you turn into the split needle uh, 
or in some cases like in the Cessna 172 it will be a needle that has swung in one direction or, or another and you turn into the direction of the needle the deviation. So here we are at a pretty good steep angle uh, and we're a good ways out now over 30 DME from the Baltimore VOR and we'll uh, be intercepting the uh, desired course uh, fairly soon. I have changed the cursor to 070 Again, the actual uh, course is 068, and when we fly this again correctly, we'll set it at that. Now you see that the split section of the needle starts to move. Uh, again, if you were in a Cessna 172 where the needle swings, it will start to swing back towards, in this case from the left, towards center. And as it does, we begin to turn the aircraft in order to make a nice smooth interception of the course. And we're at a fairly steep angle here, so uh, I can already tell that we're going to overshoot just very slightly, but not a very big uh, deal here. And you can see that even at this distance, even a fairly good angle like this, uh, the center section of the needle isn't moving very quickly. And we continue to turn uh, towards the, the desired direction of flight. And we'll make it a little bit uh, to the right uh, of, the, of the needle line to intercept the desired course. As we gradually continue our turn, you can see that we're smoothly coming to our desired course line, although, of course, this wasn't the right way to do this to begin with. So we'll refly this route and show you how it's done when you turn ahead of time. So here we are back in the cockpit and back west of the Baltimore VOR, about 30 nautical miles by DME. And we're going to fly this this time the probably more correct way. Not that there's anything wrong with overflying a VOR, and in fact some cases, and coming up uh, will be some information on it, that you would overfly the VOR, but when you have DME, you can understand your distance uh, before uh, you get to the VOR fairly accurately, with of course compensating for things like your altitude, which will allow you to make the turn in the, uh, in the right place. Now, in addition to altitude, a couple other things have to be considered. The biggest one being the actual speed, the ground speed of the aircraft. And we'll show this uh, at the end. You don't have to worry about remembering or writing it down now. The rule of thumb for turning radius of an aircraft based on ground speed is that it requires about one-third of a mile for every 60 knots of ground speed to make a 90-degree turn. So if you're flying at 180 uh, knots ground speed, it would take you three times one-third, that's there because there's 360s in 180, uh, that would require about a mile uh, in advance to turn. We're going to sit here for a moment uh, uh, just a little more than 11 DME outside the Baltimore VOR, right on course, to uh, uh, talk about how to figure out when we want to turn. Using our rule of thumb of one-third of a mile for every 60 knots of ground speed, we uh, can see that uh, we're going to have to add quite a bit for our turning radius because we're flying at a ground speed of 440 knots. Uh, this puts our turning radius for a 90-degree turn somewhere right around two and a half nautical miles. I usually add, at least for larger, faster aircraft like this, an extra quarter to a mile, so we'll call it three nautical miles to turn this aircraft uh, at a ground speed of 440 knots. And uh, keeping in mind that we're now only going to make a turn about two-thirds of that 90-degree turn, we're going to turn of uh, approximately 120 degrees to uh, 68 degrees, so not even thirds of a turn, that we won't, we will need two-thirds of it. So two minutes to make the turn. In addition, uh, we again have to keep in mind the DME distance from, uh, from the VOR. We're flying at 25,000 feet, although the observant folks will note that uh, on the replay, the um, pressure altitude did not reset. Uh, we're at 25,000 pressure altitude. It's showing uh, 25,200 uh, because of that failure to, uh, for the system to reset on replay. But nonetheless, 25,000 feet, about four and a half uh, nautical miles above the 
uh, VOR, maybe just a hair less. When we cross it is the closest DME distance we're going to get since even when we pass directly overhead uh, we'll be over four miles above the VOR station. So to the DME distance due to altitude, just a little under four and a half miles as we f if we flew directly over the VOR station, we have to add our distance to make our turn at a ground speed of 440 knots. And we already discussed that that comes out to with a little fudge factor, uh, three miles to make a 90 degree turn, but we're only going to make two thirds of that turn, so about two miles uh, for that. So that makes uh, now six and a half miles, but in addition to that, uh, I, I add a factor for uh, altitude because thinner air makes a larger turning radius. My rule of thumb is for every 10,000 feet above 5,000 feet, I add half a mile. And so uh, we're 25,000 feet, that's 20,000 feet above 5,000 feet, that would be adding two half miles or one full mile. So we have four and a half plus two plus one is seven and a half. And just for a little extra margin and so we don't have to turn too steeply, the passengers uh, like it when you turn uh, a more shallow, uh, smoother turn, we'll make our turn uh, starting at eight DME from the VOR. Just to show you where we are again on the map, we're a little more than 11 DME from the Baltimore VOR and based on our correction for altitude versus DMs from a VOR plus the amount of distance we need to make a turn plus the compensation for our relatively high al altitude where turning radius is less than at lower altitudes we'll be figuring about eight miles out which is right around here. So back in the cockpit, just under 11 DME now. We're getting ready to make our turn. We are on course. The needle is centered. And you will notice that the localizer symbol for the VOR localizer hold, or the nav hold, is off. That's because we're going to make this turn ourselves. That's the best way to avoid the cone of confusion and the best way to avoid things hunting around. Plus, we're going to want to turn early, turning now at uh, about eight miles out, not crossing the VOR. And a little bit of margin allows us to do a somewhat gentler turn as we uh, move towards the northeast. We change our cursor to 068 degrees, our desired heading outbound, and we'll hold the uh, the bank as we get closer to the VOR. Notice here uh, 4.9 DME, 4.8 pretty soon we're going to anticipate the to from needle switching. We don't expect it and it just did and we don't expect to lose the signal because we're actually skirting along the edge of the VOR. In reality you very well may if you were this close to a VOR. The modeling of the cone of confusion and the silent zone for a VOR in FSX is not uh, as accurate as it could be. It's not quite the same as the real world but it's pretty good uh, and uh, does give you uh, something to consider even if it may not be for as long of a distance as it would be in the real world. On the outbound leg, keep in mind we're still pretty close to the VOR. We don't want a very large angle of correction here to intercept the uh, outbound radial. About 10 degrees or so at this distance. We're just a couple of miles laterally away uh, from the VOR even though our DME distance is about seven and a half miles. And you see that the needle center ne of the portion of the needle begins to approach uh, the fixed portion of the needle. And as it does, we just simply fly uh, a little to the left to allow the needle to come to rest in the middle position. And just holding a very slight angle at this point, centering the needle, or the center portion of the needle on the fixed portion. And here we are on course, and about 11 DME out. <laughs>
small corrections to get things perfectly centered. And once uh, once you're very close, you can put the VOR localizer hold on and allow the autopilot to maintain uh, yourself on the outbound radial. At least until the next point where you need to take command yourself to avoid the autopilot doing funny things. And just to show you this on the map, we made our turn starting about 8 DME out from the VOR, a nice gradual turn around the VOR and intercepted the outbound 068 radial. This technique obviously is much more efficient than the first one of overflying the VOR and is one that can be done successfully with just a little bit of practice. So a quick recap. First the cone of confusion. Not uh, terribly well represented in FSX, uh, especially the loss of signal zone, which would be much wider in the real world, although the hunting characteristic is there, so makes the argument for hand flying when you're near a, a VOR. In the real world, the loss of signal would be about a mile for every mile in altitude. And to recap our rules for the distance to turn prior to a VOR when you're using the DME of a VOR. It's the altitude above the VOR plus the distance required to turn plus any compensation for very high altitudes. And the rule of thumb, turning distance of about a third of a nautical mile for every 60 knots of ground speed, that's to make a 90 degree turn. So for example, for 180 knots, which is 3 times 60 knots, is 3 times 1 third of a nautical mile for every 60 knots, or 1 mile. And for high speed aircraft, it's never a bad idea to add a little margin, a quarter or a half a mile. That's the distance for a 90 degree turn. You dis decrease the distance proportionally for turns less than 90 degrees. So for example, a 60 degree turn would be 2 thirds of that distance. For high altitudes, you need to increase the turning radius due to the decreased density of the air. My rule of thumb is a half a mile for every 10,000 feet above 5,000 feet. And you can always add a little bit extra distance for a margin of error. It also allows your turn to be a little more shallow and does give you a little extra time to intercept the outbound radial and gives you a little extra time for final adjustments. Visit our website ElitePremierVirtual.com and if you uh, sign up you can have access to some flight training materials among other things. We right now have uh, information on various aspects of flying including some instrument flying uh, information, how to build an IFR flight plan, air traffic control communication basics, and reading approach plates, along with uh, information on VOR navigation using the ADF and on uh, doing non-precision approaches. We'll be covering some non-precision approaches in future videos, so I hope you keep an eye out for uh, what we add. There's some more VOR navigation videos to follow, and we'll also be doing some NDB navigation videos. I uh, include this disclaimer. I understand the math and I understand the complexity, but the rules of thumb and simple formulas work. Maybe I'm like the bumblebee where the aerodynamics uh, experts would explain why the bumblebee cannot fly, but the bumblebee doesn't really know that and he goes on about his business and flies anyway. Thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.